Uh, thanks, everybody. We're going to talk a little bit about the communist approach to strategy, tactics, and alliances this evening. And <clears throat> when I first joined the Communist Party, which was almost three decades ago, I had spent a fair bit of time testing out different groups on the left. These included the NDP, as well as some of the different Marxist political organizations. And one of the main things that drew me to the Communist Party was its focus on and treatment of strategy and tactics. The strategy refers to our overall plan for achieving a goal, and tactics are the concrete application of that strategy in specific conditions. And generally, uh, tactics are geared towards more specific objectives which relate to the overall goal. Now, we're all familiar with Marx's famous comment from the thesis on Feuerbach, which is also inscribed on his grave, that philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. Well, it's strategy and tactics that brings us to that point. That is our live conduit into the concrete class struggle. A correct approach to strategy and tactics means that whether the working class movement is weak or strong, whether it's under attack or on the attack, whether it's fighting in a defensive position or an offensive one, communists can find a channel into the working class struggle and help to build it and move it forward. Our strategic line takes us into the fights for reforms, but it takes us away from the limits and illusions of reformism. Those illusions limit the class struggle to the fighting of reforms, or fighting for reforms only. Communist strategy promotes the necessity of revolution, but it rejects the self-imposed isolation of pure revolutionaries who denounce this and that as being insufficient or as being compromised while standing alone in splendid isolation from the masses. Communist strategy gets our hands dirty. It gets us into the fertile ground of the class struggle where we plant the seeds of change. <clears throat> Application of tactics in the concrete struggle is also a test. It makes us ask, are our strategy and analysis correct? It provides us with real world experience and feedback, and we use that for evaluation and correction, etc. And the communist approach is a dynamic one because changing conditions require changing tactics and maybe even changing strategies. Tactics that don't develop with the concrete conditions are doomed to be left behind by them. <clears throat> and that would be a fatal weakness in the movement for socialism if it were not armed and guided by revolutionary strategy and tactics. And this is precisely why we spend so much time and energy developing them, evaluating them, and updating them as necessary. So this evening, first we're gonna look at a, a little bit at strategy, and then we'll look at tactics, and then we'll look at a specific type of tactic, which is alliances. And we'll take some time to discuss the Communist Party's approach to each. And along the way, I'll throw in some fun facts just to keep things lively. So, strategy. Tactics emerge from strategy, and strategy emerges from a goal. And what is our goal? Well, it's socialism. It says so right in our program. Our aim is socialism. But there have been a number of different movements for socialism throughout the past two centuries, and each one promotes and follows a different strategy. <clears throat> Some of those approaches from those different movements still uh, resonate today and have an impact. There are many, but just for the purposes of this discussion, I'm going to look at three, just three general groupings, and they are utopian, reformist, and scientific. So utopian socialism is usually used to reference early 19th century movements, and perhaps the most famous was that of Robert Owen. You can look him up, he's all over Google. Utopian socialism is often thought of as having been swept aside by later movements, but its basic features still do echo today, and it's important to know what those are. It relies on moral and ethical arguments to convince people, and this is all people, including the owning class, to share and cooperate for the common good. <clears throat> and we see elements of utopian socialism in the British Labour Party under Tony Blair, uh, who publicly argued for ethical socialism. We also see it often, not all the time, but often in religious or pacifist movements for socialism, which eschew class struggle in favour of a moral appeal to all people. And I would argue that utopian socialism also informs parts of the environmental movement, 
and the mutual aid movement. At heart, this is an idealistic vision that almost always turns its eye away from the actuality of class society and certainly divorces itself from the reality and necessity of class struggle. And as such, while it may advocate and project a compelling and pleasing vision of an ideal society, it is not grounded in reality and cannot project a strategy for actually achieving socialism. Now, reformism refers to that view that fighting for reforms is sufficient, that reforms are essentially an end in themselves, the end in themselves. <clears throat> While fighting for reforms is certainly a critical component of the struggle for socialism, reformists restrict the aims and activities of the working class to winning reforms, full stop. Rather than struggle for the overthrow of capitalism, for a rupture with the capitalist system, reformism proposes that workers need only win and accumulate a sufficient quantity of reforms to that system in order to morph it into a better one. I'll quote from Lenin, who described reformism as a bourgeois deception of the workers, who, despite individual improvements, will always remain wage slaves as long as there is the domination of capital. <clears throat> reformism is a particular challenge for us here in, in Canada and many other countries because here it's the prevailing uh, ideological current in the working class movement, particularly in the trade union movement. And its main political expression is social democracy and especially the NDP. From a strategic and tactical point of view, it's important to understand reformism precisely because it is so dominant. And we need to understand what it does to the working class movement. In many ways, reformism is most limited by its view of the capitalist state, which it sees as an impartial authority standing above classes. Based on this distorted view, reformism limits people's movements to narrow parliamentary aims and partial reforms. In the working class, this leads to class collaboration and the illusion of a possible class partnership between workers and capitalists. The weakness of reformism is evidenced by the fact that much of the social democratic movement in Canada and around the world has completely abandoned the goal of socialism. <clears throat> of course, there are elements that maintain that as a goal, and often they do so under the name of democratic socialism. Many people who consider themselves democratic socialists do move into political action around key struggles, and we work with them. We work with them to advance those struggles. But objectively, overall, the def by defining the aim of socialism as being a just society or uh, a, a very good welfare state, and by positioning socialism as the outcome of endless improvements or stages of capitalism, reformism politically disarms the working class and adapts the labor movement to the preservation of capitalism not to its overthrow and replacement. And here we're going to throw in our first fun fact. So Drew will put it up and I'll read it to you. One of the major reformist groups in Britain is the Fabian Society. And the question is, who was the Fabian Society named after? Well, it was named after ancient Roman consul and dictator Quintus Fabius Maximus Vericosus, who was known as Fabius the Delayer which is probably uh, enormously uh, appropriate. <laughs> so we'll move on to scientific socialism. <clears throat> scientific socialism approaches questions of societal change from a historical viewpoint, understanding that social and political developments are largely determined by economic conditions. Change does not come about through moral appeals or through enlightened legislators, but through struggle. It's the masses who make change. Furthermore, scientific socialists recognize the class nature and role of the state. It is not a neutral and impartial body existing above classes. And while governments can be elected and changed, the capitalist state itself cannot be reformed into something else. It must be replaced by a worker's state. And this is what we mean when we talk about working class power, or the dictatorship of the proletariat, to use the classic formulation. 
And that is absolutely necessary to build socialism. Rooted in historical and dialectical materialism, Marxism-Leninism is scientific socialism, and this is the outlook of the Communist Party. Sometimes we refer to it as the theory and practice of socialism. It's important to keep in mind that it isn't a dogma uh, laid down for all time and recited uh, by rote like a catechism. Rather, it's a living, developing theory, a tool of analysis and a guide to action which incorporates the concentrated experience of all the struggles of the working class, both in Canada and around the world. And we use this to analyze the concrete conditions of the class struggle, including the nature of capitalism and its sharpening social contradictions, the balance of class forces, the composition and organization of the working class, the composition and, and organization of progressive and democratic movements, the relative strength of the revolutionary movement and other considerations. And from that analysis, we get a clearer picture of the path forward and that path forward is not always obvious. Sometimes it's not at all obvious, it's obscured. But we get a clearer picture of that path forward and we can develop a strategic line for building the class struggle. And now it's time for our second fun fact. Marx and Engels, and later Lenin, are considered the founders of scientific socialism. But who was the first writer to use the term scientific socialism? Well, it was coined in 1840 by the anarchist Pierre-Joseph Proudhon, and he used it to mean a society ruled by a government whose sovereignty rests on reason, not on sheer will. The strategy document of the Communist Party is its program, which I have here. It's called Canada's Future is Socialism. The program includes a comprehensive Marxist-Leninist analysis of the concrete conditions of class struggle in Canada, and this underpins the strategic line. The core of that line is found in Chapter 5, which is called The Working Class and People's Struggle, and in Chapter 6, which is called For a People's Government. I think the most concise statement of the Communist Party's strategy is at the end of Chapter 5, and I'm just going to read it. It's not that long. In all of its mass political work, the Communist Party strives to help build a democratic, anti-monopoly, anti-imperialist alliance. Such a new alliance will include the Communist Party and other parties and political organizations, democratic people's organizations in Quebec and English-speaking Canada, indigenous peoples, the trade unions, farm organizations, youth and student organizations, associations of intellectuals and professionals, women's and 2S LGBTIQ organizations, senior citizens organizations and cooperatives, the Communist Party works to unite all these people's forces as the basis for a democratic, anti-monopoly, anti-imperialist people's government, led by the working class, in which the Communist Party aspires to play a key role. As I say, I think that is the best, most concise summary of what our strategic direction is, right now, based on the current conditions. This alliance, this democratic, anti-monopoly, anti-imperialist alliance, would seek to advance working people's interests through all available avenues of struggle based on massive and united extra-parliamentary action. It would seek to build a parliamentary reflection which could win electoral advances and carry out a sweeping progressive program to democratize society and transform economic relations in the interests of working people and the people as a whole. It is in the effort to defend and extend these gains against the counterattacks from capital, during which the working class and its political forces become more experienced and more confident, that revolutionary conditions develop and the socialist option which we advance, which communists advance, begins to win wider support. In a nutshell then, this is the path which communists see for winning working class power and building socialism. Remember, it's mass action that makes change, so our strategy is to unite the masses in action. And it isn't just any type of mass unity. It has shape and it has content. It has a basis, and that basis is democratic, anti-monopoly, and anti-imperialist. 
It's rooted in the working class, not only because the working class is the majority of the population, but because our strategy emerges from an analysis of class society in which working class interests are, objectively, directly opposite to those of capital. And the experience of working together in capitalist society disciplines and trains workers for potential collective action. Because of this, workers can act effectively in support of their class interests against those of the capitalist class. And not only can they do this, they must do it. This is what makes them the natural leaders of all progressive forces. This is what establishes the primary importance of the labor movement, which is the most organized section of the working class. So what are some of the ingredients or the strategic elements that contribute to building such a democratic, anti-monopoly, anti-imperialist alliance? Well, there are a number, and I've, I've identified uh, five of, of the main ones. It's not exhaustive. So first is the unity of the working class. The leading role of the working class is absolutely indispensable factor for effective united action of the people against monopoly capital. And the unity of the working class is essentially to its ability to carry out that leading role. Second is a strong and united trade union movement. Unions are the basic organizations of class struggle. As the most organized section of the working class, a strong and united trade union movement is vital to the defense and advance of the class as a whole. Trade union gains serve the interests of all working people organized and unorganized, by helping to raise living standards and social conditions for workers in general. To fill its role, the trade union movement has to be united on a particular basis, and that basis is one of class struggle policies and militant action. Class struggle trade unionism and coalition building are necessary to oppose reformism and collaboration, and trade union sovereignty and independence are key elements of this. A third element is unity based on equality. So the kind of unity that we're talking about necessary to build the mass struggles of the working class and the people has to be based on equality. This means that the working class movement and the trade union movement in particular has to recognize, confront, and overcome inequalities that are perpetuated by capitalist society. These include inequalities based on gender, racialization, national identity, age, disability, and others. Fourth, national equality and sovereignty. Among the inequalities that I just mentioned, those reflecting the national question bear separate mention because they have a reflection in the structure of the state, in the case of Quebec, and also because they involve questions of land and territory. Canada is a multinational state. Within it are many indigenous nations, Acadia, Quebec, and English-speaking Canada. And English-speaking Canada is the dominant nation, not because it's best, but because it's the most powerful, it's the largest. It has the strongest hold, its interests have the strongest hold on the state and on government. Advancing the struggle requires a powerful alliance of the working class and progressive forces in all of those nations. And such an alliance must be built on the basis of a commitment to national equality and sovereignty. This includes opposing the colonial and genocidal policies which lie at the heart of the foundation of the Canadian state and which remain in place today. And it also involves recognizing the right of nations to self-determination up to and including secession. In the Communist Party, we've talked for a long time about an equal voluntary partnership of all the nations in the country. Uh, and that's the idea that we're getting at here. But the seeds of that need to be built as we're building unity of working class and progressive forces. And the fifth factor that I've identified is building alliances among people's forces. <clears throat> Monopoly capital is attacking the living standards and interests of a huge range of the population, including the working class and other strata. And this means that a broad and expanding cross-section of people are compelled to fight back against the power of capital and the state in order to defend their own economic and political interests. 
People's movements involve growing numbers of people in extra-parliamentary political activity. They're typically organized in a cross-class manner, although they involve many working-class people, often a majority of working-class people. To build a vehicle for democratic and social advance, we need to work to unite these forces with the working class, particularly with the trade union movement, and build broad coalitions. We sometimes refer to a people's coalition or people's alliance. And this effort lays the foundation for a more fully developed democratic anti-monopoly, anti-imperialist alliance to emerge. As I said, there are other elements to the Communist Party's strategic line, but these are some of the main ones. I think what's key is to keep in mind that these all contribute to the central and immediate aim, which is to unite all the people's forces into that democratic, anti-monopoly, anti-imperialist alliance that is led by the working class. So tactics. So now that we have a strategy, we need to concretely apply it in the struggles of the working class and the people. And this is where the question of tactics comes in. Because working people are involved in so many different areas of struggle, there's a wide range of tactics that communists use, and I'm going to just go through some of them. Again, not all of them, but some of them. So the first is the press, the communist press. We don't usually think of the press in, in a tactical sense, but it is, in fact, one of the primary vehicles for applying our strategy in the immediate and most important day-to-day -day struggles of working people. The press is an agitator, an educator, an agitator, and an organizer. Three roles. And it's often the first voice of the party that people encounter. And this is why we stress that all members need to read, build, and spread the press. And here's another uh, tactical element that, uh, that you probably don't think of as being tactics, and that's the party club. Clubs are organizational tactics. Their purpose is to build the strongest connection between the party and working people in a particular area. So we give very careful thought to what those areas are and how we want to organize within them. Most often, now, clubs are based on geographic areas or neighborhoods, or individual cities. But we also have workplace or industry-based clubs and we also have clubs that are organized in specific immigrant communities, particularly if the community needs a club in their own language. Elections. We know that you don't elect socialism, but communists understand that the parliamentary arena is an indispensable element of the class struggle. And here again, I, I think this is a useful quote from Lenin. He wrote, uh, we Bolsheviks participated in the most counter-revolutionary parliaments, and experience has shown that this participation was not only useful, but indispensable to the party of the revolutionary proletariat after the first bourgeois revolution in Russia, 1905, so as to pave the way for the second bourgeois revolution in February 1917, and then for the socialist revolution in October 1917. And this explains or helps us to understand why communists reject calls from the ultra-left to boycott elections. Yes, bourgeois elections are limited. Everybody knows that. But from the time that our party was founded in 1921, it has participated in elections at the municipal, provincial, and federal levels. We also reject the electoralism of social democrats and other reformists whose sole focus is on winning votes and getting elected. And that focus, that, that limited focus, leads them to compromise their policies according to bourgeois polling. And it also leads them to attempt to subordinate the mass movement to electoral campaigns. And probably all of us have seen this. Instead, communists approach elections as a parliamentary expression of the extra-parliamentary movement. We try to use electoral campaigns to further agitate and organize people into that mass movement, not to subordinate it to an electoral campaign. In elections, usually, communists run openly on party tickets at federal and provincial levels, although during times of illegality or when progressive alliances have been strong enough to participate in elections, Communists have run under different tickets, 
And I'll give a couple examples. Um, the Labour Progressive Party, which was the party's, uh, the Communist Party's legal political organization from 1943 to 1958 when the Communist Party itself was banned. And another example is the United Progressive Movement, which was a popular front uh, uniting communists, social democrats, and other progressives in the late 1930s to the early 1940s. And uh, incidentally, that, uh, that party, that ticket, the United Progressive Movement ticket, was the one that uh, the first uh, Communist Party of Canada member to be elected to Ottawa, Doris Nielsen, she ran on that ticket. And now we're going to go to our next fun fact. So, <laughs> here's a fun fact. The first Communist Party member to be elected in provincial government was Phil Christopher's in Alberta in July 1921, uh, four weeks after the party was formed. He ran in the election on the Dominion Labour Party ticket. The Dominion Labour Party was affiliated to the Canadian Labour Party, which was um, uh, a united front effort against capital that the Communist Party supported for a while. And Christopher's was re-elected in the 1926 election. Now, municipally, I want to talk a little bit about municipal elections because our tactic is slightly different. Um, municip municipally, communists in Canada tend to participate in elections as part of a progressive civic reform movement. Uh, and this reflects the fact that, first of all, party politics don't really exist at the municipal government level. Uh, there are people, members of parties, but it doesn't function like, a, like parliament or like, a, like a provincial parliaments do either. And this means that the possibilities for, this is the second reason, that the possibilities for building people's alliances at the municipal level are much greater. So we take that opportunity and we do it as much as we can. So I'll give you some examples of the types of municipal electoral alliances that communists have worked on. Um, the Labour, Labour Election Committee in Winnipeg, uh, the Edmonton Voters Association, and Vancouver's Committee of Progressive Electors, later called the Coalition of Progressive Electors. And there were others too, uh, in, in many parts of the, of the country. But those are some good examples. And this brings us to yet another fun fact. <laughs> the very first person elected anywhere in North America under the red banner of the Communist Party was William Kolesnik in 1926 in Winnipeg. This is just five years after the party's founding and Kolesnik won election to Winnipeg City Council. He remained in office for four terms until 1930. They had one year terms. He pressed for public transit, improvements to unemployment relief and workers' rights, and notably, he's credited with helping the city's municipal workers to unionize, including by advocating on their behalf as a member of council. Here's another set of, uh, another area of our tactical work that often people don't think of as tactical, and that's policies, platforms, and slogans. So policies, I mean here political policies, as you would find in an election platform. Policies and slogans are among the most plentiful and among the most public tactics that communists use. Policies typically um, are, are for a demand for a specific reform, just as an example, the $23 minimum wage. And slogans usually highlight and popularize a particular policy or demand, but they can also be used to agitate for a particular action, such as the call for strike support. Here again, our approach is different from, say, reformists. Reformists approach policies as ends in themselves. There's something to be implemented as part of the endless reform of capitalism. Their slogans are usually a call for electoral support on the promise of implementing that policy. Communists, however, approach policies and slogans in a tactical way, focusing on using them as a way to unite and organize people into the fight for immediate and meaningful reforms, and in the process build the class struggle in a revolutionary direction. Without question, this approach can be very, very challenging because it often involves navigating conflicting pressures, like the desire to advance the most radical policy or call to action, versus the need to not lose sight of the mass movement where it's at and risk isolating ourselves from it. This is an 
a constant challenge that we face, and it dealing with it requires that consistent and repeated analysis of what are the concrete conditions in the movement we're working with. What is the balance of forces? What's the composition? Where are people active? Where are they not active? We never want to split the movement. Well, sometimes movements need to be split if there's collaborationism. And, but generally, we don't want to split a movement by getting ahead of it, right? We want to stay in it. We have to work with the masses. And that means working with people where they're at and winning them, winning them, winning them. We can't win them by just standing out on the street corner and shouting slogans at them. We have to win them by taking our slogans and our positions and building those movements and winning people to our positions. Yeah, yeah so this is the last section. We're going to talk a little bit about alliances as a, as a particular tactic and how we approach them. And hopefully I can get in to address some of the questions that have come up. So working in and building up people's alliances is crucial to our strategy for socialism. Typically, uh, alliances or social movements, typically they're formed by groups of people who share a common specific concern and a commitment to political action around that concern. And so there's a number of examples, but they would include peace and anti-war groups, pro-choice networks, international solidarity committees, climate justice coalitions, student organizations, and, and many others, many, many others. In almost every one of those cases, alliances are cross-class formations, bringing together people from different classes and strata. And while working people, working class people, are often in the majority in those movements, they're often not the leadership of those movements. Um, Because of that cross-class nature, that heterogeneity, class heterogeneity of these movements, there's often an eclectic and sometimes even contradictory um, mix of political or ideological currents within them. It would be, though, a mistake to dismiss um, all of those different currents, all of that, that heterogeneity as just being, oh, this is just a petty bourgeois movement and we'll leave it. And I say that because sometimes it is frustrating and sometimes it's easy to be dismissive like that, but we have to resist that. In many cases, a lack of ideological clarity in a mass organization, in a, in a progressive movement or a people's organization, can be a reflection of its organizational immaturity, of an early stage of development. And as it does work, as it engages in more struggles, things get clarified. We shouldn't be surprised by this. This is exactly how consciousness develops, right? Through experience. Matter precedes knowledge. Sometimes within these different movements, we find, you know, uh, biases, biases against working class. Uh, and in particular, we often well, maybe not often, but sometimes find um, prejudices against the trade union movement. There is, um, there is a view among some people that uh, the working class has, has been bought off, especially in a wealthy country like Canada. It's been bought off. It's no longer part of the progressive movement. Uh, it's part of the establishment, and we don't want to work with them. Astonish I'll share a story with you. Astonishingly, I was working in a May Day committee a few years ago and suggested that we needed to have some unions involved and was told, well, the unions are all part of the establishment. Absolutely baffling that a committee seeking to build May Day would have such a view, a dismissive and dismissive view towards, uh, towards trade unions. Just absolutely bizarre. And all that does, all that view does is drives a wedge between the labor and democratic movements, the labor and the people's movements. And who does that serve? That serves capital, full stop. So we have to be aware of that and we have to confront that. Most of the movements that emerge, most of those social movements, and certainly the ones that we would eyeball and, and work with, are essentially anti-monopoly in character. They may not 
They may not say that, but that's what they are. Think of the climate justice movement. At a certain point, pretty quickly, it's coming up against the policies of corporate Canada. Against the, it has to deal with the reality that the decades and decades of expansion of capitalism is behind the climate crisis and is driving the climate crisis and is actively preventing resolutions to the climate crisis. Whether or not they're formed on that basis of anti-monopoly, they're often objectively uh, in that position. And similar with anti-imperialist position, you know, in the peace movement, for example. It's... You're going to meet lots of peace activists and anti-war activists who don't talk about imperialism, who glaze over when you talk about imperialism, but they are objectively opposed to imperialism, even if they don't always realize it. And this is important because this objective reality draws those movements or major, major elements of those movements closer and closer to the working class and the labor movement. And this is what we want to see. This is what we work towards. So how do communists approach this? Well, we, we approach it, first of all, by not diminishing, but by recognizing the positive role that those democratic and, and progressive and people's movements play in the struggle for fundamental change, even with the limitations, even with their you know, lack of development uh, or what have you. And we work constantly to bring those forces into closer cooperation with one another and with the working class movement. There are two things that, two, two trends, I guess, uh, tendencies, that we have to be aware of and avoid. And they are within in our work and alliances, and they are a right wing and a left wing trend. The left wing trend, and I mean far, you know, ultra left, leftist trend, would be to just write off all of those movements or one movement in, you know, a movement in particular as being um, tangential to the class struggle. A bourgeois deviation from the class struggle uh, is an expression that some, you know, we've heard. And I'll give an example of this. The, the climate justice movement, when Greta Thunberg, Greta Thunberg, uh, when she came, there was all kinds of people who said, well, she's, she sailed here on a boat that was paid for by a corporate sponsorship, ergo, she's just a greenwashing shill for capital, and we should just not go out. Well, excuse me. Her tour brought out thousands and thousands and thousands of young people, of working people, of unions, of indigenous people and their supporters, together to protest climate change and to, and to call for action on climate justice. And included in that often was an explicit call for recognition of indigenous rights. This is very, very important. This is a big step forward. This is something we, we work for. This is, the, this is the kind of connection and the kind of move forward that we are committed to seeing. And yet because Greta Thunberg had a boat with some corporate logo on it or whatever it was, were willing to write it off as a bourgeois deviation from the real class struggle. Well, how ridiculous is that? It's, it's sectarian and it needs to be avoided. The other tendency that sometimes happens is a, is a, a right word tendency. And that is for people, for, for people on the left, to see these movements as really being the cutting edge in the struggle against monopoly that they are the new force for change, surpassing the working class. And we end up punting the class issue aside and focusing on the social issue. Certainly there are times, certainly there are times when social movements have a more advanced policy than the trade union movement, of course. But again, we have to ask what's the, What's the primary force for, for the kind of change, the kind of fundamental change that we're looking to? And that is the working class. We cannot ever lose sight of that. Related to that is what we sometimes call tailism, where the party just stops acting like an independent entity and it starts to just adopt the most current, uh, the most loudly made, 
uh, demands from, from the social movements. And sometimes that's okay. If the anti-poverty movement is saying we need a $24 minimum wage, and our policy was for 18, well, they're onto something, you know? <laughs> That's not the way it worked, by the way. But if, if it's the other way around, and we feel that the demand needs to be for rent rollbacks to a level where nobody's compelled to pay more than 20% of their income on rent, and somebody says, well, the movement out there is not really hip on that, they want rent controls, but they're not convinced of uh, rent rollbacks. We aren't going to jettison that demand. It's an important demand. We're going to fight for it. To lose that demand because it's, it's convenient, because it, it allows us to work more easily with a mass movement, that is tailism. And we have to avoid that as well. We have to seek all avenues of cooperation with these mass organizations, with these mass movements. And at the same time, we have to work steadily to help them to adopt and accept more of our positions, our ideological approach, our political approach, our strategic approach. But we cannot do that in a patronizing way. To stand on the, on the corner and just tell everybody what they're doing wrong, nobody's going to listen to us. Just think if you're, if you're uh, building a shed in your backyard and, uh, or better yet, if you're changing a, 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 changing a flat tire in your car and you got the thing jacked up and you're, and you're taking the wheel off and you're struggling and you got a neighbor who's standing beside you just watching, you know, kind of watching, maybe smirking, shaking their head. And because you didn't jack the car up properly, it falls down and crushes your foot. And your neighbor comes over and says, you know, I knew that was going to happen. What you should have done, well, you're probably going to have a lot to say to that neighbor. And it's probably not going to be, gee, thank you for telling me after my foot's crushed what I could have done better. It's kind of the same thing when we go into alliances. We can't just stand there and be smug and arrogant, even if we're shaking our heads because of some of the weirdness that is said. These are cross-class alliances. They can be ideologically complex. But we have to deal with that. We have to work with them. We have to find a path to moving them into a stronger direction. And I'll just, here again, I'll quote from good old Lenin. I realize I'm doing that a lot. But Lenin says, uh, wrote that every revolutionary has to learn to bring about this change of front among the various sections and groups of the broad masses of Democrats if they are convinced that serious and deep going historical reasons for such a turn exist. Basically, if we care about that mass organization, if we think that that movement means something, we have to honestly commit to building it and not be arrogant and on the sidelines about it. I mentioned at the same time, it's important that the party maintain its independence when it goes into these movements. Um, we are an independent organization with our own theory, with our own strategy, with our own tactics, with our own policies, and we don't want to submerge that into another movement. But in respecting our own independence, we also have to respect the independence of those mass organizations. They, we work with them, but we don't control them. They aren't a conveyor belt for party analysis, and we can't try to change them into that. I'll finish just by talking a little bit about the trade union movement. The trade union movement is unique among social movements in that it rep it's organized on a class basis. It's workers organized as workers, and they're organized at the point of production. So they're workers organized as workers in the class struggle. It's not a cross-class movement. But it's also not a movement whose members join it based on a shared concern and commitment to political action. Most union members in Canada didn't join a trade union. They got a job. They got a job in a place that someone else had organized. And that's not their fault. That's just the way it works. 
So it's not uh, the type of movement where people gravitate towards out of a political conviction. Hopefully they develop that political conviction, but that makes it very different from social movements. The trade union movement has a right wing and a center and a left wing politically. And right now, usually the left wing is the smallest of the three. And the trade union movement in Canada, as I mentioned, is absolutely dominated by social democratic reformist ideology. And this is particularly true in English speaking Canada, where the trade union movement, most of it, the vast majority of it, in fact, has organizational ties to the NDP. The challenge that we face as communists is to win the center to the left and in the process to isolate the right wing. Tactically, what this means is positioning and promoting the strongest possible calls for action, the strongest policies that will still have a chance of winning mass support and help bring the movement to the left into the class struggle more directly, more, more uh, consciously into the class struggle. So I'll give an example of, of what I mean here. Right now in Ontario, the OFL, the Ontario Federation of Labour, has initiated a campaign, the Enough is Enough campaign. And it's got some good policies. It's got a certain amount of promise. We support the campaign. We support building the campaign. We support building it in a particular direction which is towards escalating class struggle, towards mass action, towards uniting the OFL with its social and community partners, towards engaging uh, those two large unions, which are currently outside of the House of Labor, Unifor and the Teamsters, and to, do it to, to building it on a local level with Labor Council leadership so that there's local, you know, local fight back committees formed local resistance committees that mushroom up into a provincial coordination. We call for, as I said, escalating actions leading up to building towards a political strike, the political strike weapon, which is a general strike. And, you know, the more, uh, the most recent experience in Ontario that we would, most of us have to look towards is the days of action that uh, were organized in the mid to late 1990s. Um, against the Mike Harris conservative government. It wasn't perfect, but that's the, that's the sort of type of fight back that we were hoping and that we are agitating for labor to build. What this means, though, is you're not going to see communists in those Enough is Enough campaign meetings, you're not going to see communists standing there just saying, General strike now! General strike now! Why? Does it mean that we don't support a general strike? Of course not. We fight for and campaign for the political strike weapon to be used by labor. We call for it. But calling for it and building for it can be two really different things. Most workers in Canada are not in a union. Most union members have never been on strike. And a very, 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 very tiny number proportion of union members have been involved in a political strike or a general strike. And so just calling for them to go out in the face of a government, for example, who has already said, we'll fine every one of you $5,000 a day for, for a political strike. We'll fine your union $100,000 a day for every day that you're out on a political strike. People know that. They know what they're up against. What they don't always know is their own power that they have. And we need to help build that, build that confidence, build that experience. So I mentioned the days of action back in the 90s. It was a long time building those shutdown strikes. They weren't just done by simple calls. They were done by steady, hard work at the local level, at the provincial level, a lot of time, a lot of energy, uh, a lot of money went into that to make sure that we had the basis for building towards those, those shutdown strikes which went through most cities in Ontario 
and could have and should have gone to the level of a provincial shutdown strike, but for various reasons were, were scuttled. But the point is, you know, you can't even have a regular strike without organization. How do we expect to build a political strike without organization? To stand and just say, we can do this by calling for it, a left winger who does that has absolutely no business pretending that, it, that they can contribute to a, to a movement for socialism. We know better and we approach it differently. So what do we try to do in the trade union movement? We try to organize left currents, left caucuses we often call them, always with the idea that the goal is not to just gloriously isolate ourselves with our pure left rhetoric, but to actually engage in the struggle, to win the center to the left, not to abandon the center to the right, which is exactly what happens with the ultra left, with the sectarian left in the labor movement. And we see it happening all the time. We work to promote independent trade union political policy and action. The reason for this, one of them, is to move the trade union movement away from its slavish reliance on the NDP. Our argument is that rather than automatic and unconditional electoral support for the NDP, labor needs to come up with its own political platform. And candidates need to measure up to that platform in order to win labor's support. And if that's a majority of NDPers, which it likely would be, let's be honest, because they have the size of party, then fine, at least there's a level that they've had to reach. We also avoid rank and fileism. This is a, a, a maybe a bit tricky. We call for, you know, engagement of the grassroots. We call for internal union democracy, of course. Um, but we don't counterpose the membership to the leadership in a simplistic way. And, and when I refer to rank and fileism, what I'm referring to is that tendency which glorifies the grassroots and ascribes to it some sort of revolutionary virtue, while at the same time wiping away the leadership and painting it all as a bunch of class betrayers and sellouts. That's not helpful, right? The trade union, any movement, is strongest when it has strong left leaders as well as an engaged left membership which supports them. We approach the trade union movement on political terms, not on personality terms. And so when we talk about building left caucuses, we are prepared to and we would like to be able to engage not just, of course, the grassroots, but also those leaders. And in particular, we would focus on what sometimes we refer to as the non-commissioned officer level of the trade union movement. And that's local leaders, uh, labor council uh, leaders and, and activists. Um, but we are certainly not averse to working with, you know, those provincial and affiliate heads who show some, some class struggle guts. And again, if you look at the history of the, the best moments of struggle in the Canadian labor movement, you'll see it's when there was a strong membership ref which had, uh, was reflected in a strong left leadership as well, not counterposed. And this brings me to my last fun fact. Where was the first general strike in Canada? Most people think it was Winnipeg. It was actually a year earlier in Vancouver on August 2nd, 1918. The key issues were federal conscription, censorship of socialist publications, surprising, and workers' demands for higher wages. The idea of a general strike had been discussed for some time, and it was finally organized as a one-day political protest after the killing of labor activist Ginger Goodwin by police on July 27th. So just in summary, I'll just say this, that workers wage a daily struggle in their workplace for better wages and better conditions. But socialist theory doesn't arise spontaneously out of those workplace struggles. 
Socialist theory and consciousness, political consciousness, comes from without. And this is the role of the Communist Party, which is to fuse scientific socialism with the daily class struggles of working people. And in the process, we spread political and social con socialist consciousness among workers. Our approach to strategy and tactics determines how we do this and how effective we are going to be. Strategy and tactics are determined and evaluated in concrete conditions. They're based on our best analysis and they're always determined and developed with the awareness that we have to campaign to the masses if we are going to build a revolutionary movement that can achieve socialism. So thanks and I look forward to the discussion.